The Royal Air Force, 42 years old, looks back upon the short span of time which has already begun man's journey to the stars. The First World War, in 1917, that veteran military expert General Smuts foresaw that a unified Air Force was needed. A year later, men of the Royal Flying Corps and the Royal Naval Air Service were united to form the Royal Air Force. The 270 aircraft and 2,000 men who'd formed their crews in 1914 had grown to 300,000 with a fleet that numbered 22,000 planes. In that final year of the war, the RAF's doctrine of the offensive carried the war deep into German territory and swept the German fighters from the skies. But it was not a one-sided war. German aircraft fought back up to the final days of the war. New engines, new planes, new pilots went to France to replace the losses. It was a battle to decide who could keep most planes in the sky. The years of peace might have made the RAF a force of forgotten men. But behind the scenes, men of foresight were struggling to ensure an air force that could again defend Britain if the need should come. The fruits of that foresight were seen at Hendon in the RAF's annual air display. To fit the new pattern, a new type of flyer was needed. In these, the first temporary buildings of the RAF Cadet College at Cranmore would train the men whose leadership and knowledge ensured victory in the air 20 years later. Back in the 1920s, at the Halton Apprentice School, Lord Trenchard was the hero of the RAF, for it was his determined post-war plan which was keeping the country and also the government air-minded. His was a policy of quality to replace the wartime quantity. The crowds who flocked to the early air displays at Hendon watched with pride planes like these Siskins. Spitalgate, DH-9As turned out. These were familiar scenes of the 1920s all over the country. The RAF foresaw that any future war would be decided in the air. Bombs were still small and high-level attacks were a thing of the future. Bombing was an operation for tactical commanders in the field, but already behind the scenes there were planes taking shape on the drawing board which would make possible a new technique, long-distance strategic bombing to paralyze industrial production and cripple transport. Planes that proved this possible were aircraft like this Ferry 3D, the pioneer over the Cape Takaro route. Airships proved that a heavily laden plane could be launched in mid-air and thus given a longer range. But aircraft were still clumsy contrivances, slow and easily damaged. Even the flying boat departed little from the lines which had become traditional for aircraft. When the change came, it came suddenly, and it was a civilian air competition which brought it the Schneider Trophy race. In this British Supermarine S6, winner outright of the Schneider Trophy, can be seen the first almost ghostly outline of the fighters which nine years later fought the Battle of Britain. But that, the long drawn out struggle, high in the air above the Kentish hop fields and the Sussex Downs, still seemed improbable and far away in those years of the early 1930s. The change came swiftly. War in Abyssinia, followed by the German threat in Central Europe, by Chamberlain's meetings with Hitler, and by war. This was just 20 years ago. People called it the phony war. Even Dunkirk, when it came, seemed a distant disaster to most people in Britain who'd not yet heard a shot fired in anger. It was from the muzzles of the Spitfires and the trigger fingers of the RAF fighter pilots who flew them that Britain had her revenge for Dunkirk. High over southeast England, during that long, hot summer and autumn of 1940, the regular and auxiliary squadrons of the RAF had in their hands an air weapon forged by the brains and skill of two decades. On the ground, the Women's Auxiliary Air Force handled the giant barrage balloons which harass low-flying enemy bombers. Their service freed more men to fly and paved the way for the permanent place that the Women's Royal Air Force holds today. But fighters and barrage balloons were defensive weapons of war. The Royal Air Force now began to explore the weaknesses of German defences in what was to become the greatest continuous onslaught of bombing attacks ever known. German communications, the vital railway system upon which the tremendous network of armies in a dozen countries depended, were the first targets. Day by day, night by night, the strength of the attacks grew steadily, backed by the output of British war factories and the training centres both in Britain and abroad, which were producing the skilled men needed to fly bombers right into the heart of enemy territory.
This was a 1,000 bomber raid, pulverizing the German factories that built their tanks, their guns, and also the very fighters needed to drive the bombers back. Enemy shipping attempting to run the blockade also met the RAF, already skilled in working far out at sea from their years of escorting British convoys. Few German ships reached home. Germany was still far from beaten. This was the V-1, the droning terror by night, designed to sap the morale of Britain just at the moment of the Allied landings in France. Could the Spitfires and Hurricanes, which had halted the German bombers, also halt the V-1? Spitfires which had now been joined by Tempests and by other faster aircraft. This was the hunt for the killer bombs. Then came the great airborne operations, which carried the army deep into Europe and the final victory. But afterwards, the RAF still had commitments all over the world. There was little chance to relax, though the pattern had changed again. The uneasy years of the Cold War meant that planes and men must be kept in readiness throughout the world. Cyprus, Kenya, Suez, all these provided difficult and exacting tasks. The Berlin airlift, defeating a blockade imposed by the Russians, was a massive transport undertaking. Carried out jointly by the RAF and the American Air Force, this was a renewal of the wartime partnership of a few years earlier. It was this operation by two air forces which enabled a firm stand to be taken in future negotiations about Berlin and established that the West had not weakened since the war. Review of 1953 gave the RAF a chance to parade its new strength to Queen and country. 400 years earlier, another Elizabeth had attended parades, watched her seamen prepare for long voyages into the unknown. Was this thought in the mind of Queen Elizabeth II as she saw the new men of her air force and the shapes of the planes which were bringing man nearer to the stars? The Queen with the Drakes, the Frobishers, the Raleighs, the adventurers of the present day. And these, the aircraft, a sycamore helicopter. The letters. These are Lincolns. The meteors. The Cambrons. The Swifts. And the Victor Bomber. What pilot of World War I would see in this the descendant of the frail string and canvas planes he flew? And this is the Vulcan, another of the V bombers. A fire streak rocket fitted below a Swift. Guided weapons have brought a vast new sphere of activity for the RAF. This is the bloodhound in the design and construction of guided missiles. The partnership between the men of the RAF and those of the American Air Force has been continued. But meanwhile, the bread and butter work of the Royal Air Force has not lagged behind. New and better planes and the perfecting of conventional armaments is constantly underway. For those looking back, remembering how it all began, the trials, errors, triumphs and tragedies, the story of the RAF has been a dramatic example of progress. For those looking forward, the next 42 years will hold even more. For looking ahead into the possibilities open to man in the sky, the RAF can see no horizon. Time, hard work and determination have taken them far. The same will take them further yet.